Hello everyone. This video today is to tell you a little bit about the literary definition of the term paradox and to look specifically at how it's used in, in the opening act of Macbeth. So to look first at our definition, a paradox is a self-contradictory statement. That is, when you say it out loud, it sounds like both parts are true, but they can't be true at the same time. If you look at the picture here, if the red button says the blue button is true, but the blue button says the red button is false, how can both of those things be true at the same time? And that's an example of a paradox. Now, why would a writer ever want to do this? I mean, what's the purpose of using a paradox if they're two statements that just seem to cancel each other out? Well, one thing that it can do is highlight a moment of conflict in a particular um, event to show that this is in conflict by having the people speak lines that seem to be contradictory. It can also act as a foil. One part can sort of illuminate the other part by contrast. And it can also help to sum up some of the main ideas and the themes in a work, uh, particularly works that are particularly complex. Now, you see paradoxes around you all the time, and you probably hear people say them. Some of these are famous quotes. Some of them are from Shakespeare, as a matter of fact. When we say things like jumbo shrimp, I mean, shrimp, by definition, is something that's really small. So how can it be jumbo? But what we're saying is, out of all of these shrimp, these are the biggest of the smallest. See how that works? Uh, you can save money by spending it. Youth is wasted on the young. A wise fool. Uh, no one goes there anymore because it's too crowded. Well, how can both of those things be true? If it's too crowded, then clearly someone's going there. I can resist anything except temptation. Words like bittersweet contain a paradox right within the word. Dark lightning. Um, if you don't get this message, please respond. And how are you supposed to respond if you didn't get the message? I must be cruel to be kind. That's actually another Shakespearean quote. And it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Well, how can it be both of those things at the same time? And these are just some examples that you may have seen or heard around from other places and times. Now let's look at some of the paradoxes that we've already seen in Act One of Macbeth. We begin right in the very first scene with the witches giving us the setting when they say fair is foul and foul is fair. So from the very opening, Shakespeare's painting this picture of this world in conflict. Then when Macbeth comes in, his very first lines that he speaks in a play echo what the witches just said and are also this paradox, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Later on in that same act, the witches greet Macbeth with a series of paradoxical statements, or greet Banquo, uh, lesser than Macbeth and greater, not so happy, yet much happier. Um, how can these things all be true as they're greeting Banquo? And that's sort of part of what Shakespeare is setting up for you is this idea that everything is sort of unsettled, everything is, at, is not at ease. Two more examples that we see of paradox, and this is all just in Act One of Macbeth, mind you. Um, Macbeth is thinking about this prophecy that the witches have just made and said, this supernatural soliciting cannot be good, cannot be ill. Uh, well, if it's, it's either one thing or the other, right? The witches have either given him really good news or they've given him really bad news. How can they be both? And later on, uh, Lady Macbeth is giving advice to her husband about how to act as they're planning on killing Duncan. And she says, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. It's that idea of that conflict between what seems to be a really pretty sweet flower, but has that snake sort of underneath it. How can you be both of these things? How can you be both innocent and the serpent at the same time? And finally, in Act One, we see some examples of paradox that aren't direct lines that characters speak, but are just set up in the very situations. The first is this key idea that if Macbeth is destined to be king, does he have to do anything to make it happen? I mean, if it's your destiny, then it's going to happen no matter what you do. But Macbeth also feels like, well, if it's his destiny, then he has to take it into his own hands and go and make it happen. Lady Macbeth has that whole speech where she ponders the thought that she feels more like a man than her man. Uh, she thinks about how he's too full of the milk of human kindness, is the expression she uses, while at the same time she's asking the spirits to unsex her. In other words, to take away all of the female characteristics, her mother's milk, and turn that more into poison. And then finally, we have the paradox where Duncan picks Macbeth's house to stay in precisely because he's so admiring of Macbeth and because he trusts him and thinks that this will definitely be a place where he will be safe without having any idea, of course, of what Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are plotting against him.
So here are your next steps as we continue reading the play. First of all, keep track of more examples of paradox as you see them play out throughout the next four acts as we keep reading. And then also be ready when you get back to class to give the definition of the literary term, what is a paradox, and give us at least one example from Act 1. This could be one of the lines that people speak or one of the situations that's set up. And that's it for tonight. Good night.